Hey, what's up? I'm Adam. If you're new and if you're returning, then you know what's good. So I want to talk about site reliability engineers. It's a very hot topic in tech at the moment. And there's a real demand for SREs in many companies. So we're going to get into what an SRE is, why the demand is so high. What are the pillars of SRE, or site reliability engineering? What kind of skills is in the toolbox of an SRE? And what the day-to-day -day may look like? What kind of task you may get up to? So if you find that useful, you find that interesting, then stick with me. I've been an SRE for three and a half months now, and I thought this would be really important and really useful video for some people. So let's just get into it. So what is a site reliability engineer or an SRE? Well, as the name might suggest, an SRE is tasked with ensuring the reliability of a service. What does that kind of mean though? Why does that even matter? Well, let's think about today where there are so many things on offer. Service here may mean a website, an application, right? A service, of like a streaming service. Well, there's so much competition out there, right? So what happens if you go onto a website or, you know, you try to access a particular application or service and it doesn't perform how you expect, right? Like it's only available half the time. Like half the time you click on it, you get an error and you can't even see the site or it takes 10 minutes to get the data that you actually want to see. We're well, not going to be happy. And in a world where there are so many other options, you're going to go to a competitor and that's not great for any company, right? And so that is the role of the SRE to ensure that the service is reliable and that it is available at a level that is acceptable for the user, right? Ultimately, it's all about the user, the site reliability engineers. And so how is that realized? Well, site reliability engineers spend about half their time doing proactive work and the other half doing reactive work. Reactive meaning if something does go wrong with the service, the site, the application, it's the responsibility of the SRE on call to make sure that that's cleaned up as quickly as possible, like that we get to resolving that issue as quickly as possible so that that service availability is back up, right? So that you as a user can use the service as you expect as quickly as possible. And so the other half of the time is spent doing proactive work, right? So putting things in place, systems in place to ensure that those failures, those introduction of bugs happen less frequently and that the reliability of the service can be ensured. If you research site reliability engineering, then you're going to come across the phrase quite frequently, which is the idea that is supplying software engineering principles to operation issues, right? So not just seeing operations as a standalone, but seeing it as embedded in a wider system and applying the principles of software engineering and how we may approach applications, how we may approach bugs in the code and applying that to operations to facilitate service reliability. Ultimately, the goal is to create a highly scalable and highly reliable service for the end user. So if you're familiar with DevOps, then some of the things I'm saying may sound quite familiar and there's a question that raises its head quite often which is well what's the difference between a site reliability engineer and a devops engineer well it's a good question and you'll ask different people and you'll get different answers but from what i understand devops is a culture right it's a higher level concept um, an aim for how you want your system to operate whereas site reliability engineering is the practical implementation of that right like an sre has the skills in their toolbox to actually realize that culture of DevOps. And that's pretty much it. For that reason, you'll find that a lot of the pillars of DevOps overlap with the pillars of SRE, which leads us into the next point of this video, which is what are the pillars of site reliability engineering? Well, the first one is that operations should be seen as a software problem, right? We already spoke about that and how we can apply engineering principles and the way we look at software issues to operations. The second pillar is the emphasis on service level. Okay, and By service level, we're talking about availability of the service. And we have objectives, service level objectives, which are effectively what we deem acceptable. They are written explicit values for what is an acceptable service. And they're really important in ensuring that it's clear amongst the team, amongst all those involved, what we are classing as a reliable system. Okay, And so you have service level objectives, but you also have a service level agreement. And that agreement is pretty much between you and the users of your service, right? And it's pretty high. But your service level objectives need to be even higher because this is like your internal checks. So when that's breached, people can start doing the work that needs to be done to get it back up and running. And you haven't yet hit or breached your service level agreement between you and your customers. The next pillar of site reliability engineering is the reduction of toil. Now, toil are those repetitive, manual, low return tasks that are often associated with operations, right? And they're really resource intensive often with the time um, and just the engineers that have to be involved in this. So you really wanna reduce this and automation is a key way of achieving this, of course. 
And there's a saying that if something can be automated, then it should be. Now, there is obviously a caveat to that, because if it's going to take six months and you're going to have to pull six engineers off the work they're doing to achieve that, to automate that toil, automate that task, then you have to work out, will the payoff be good enough for, you know, what we have to forfeit for this? So that leads me nicely into the fourth pillar, which is automation as a standalone. Now, there's so many benefits to automation, such as efficiency, reduction in human error. And so, as you can imagine, it plays a really big part in ensuring the reliability of a site. Um, and it could be that you're automating the build process. You could be automating the testing. You could even be introducing like, infrastructure as code. So removing the need of anyone to come in, the engineer, and manually log into a console or into some sort of user interface and you know configure the infrastructure there that's removed there's one document the code is there it's immutable so no one can just come in and accidentally introduce a bug or introduce some sort of error that breaks your whole thing um and so those are really important features of sres the fifth pillar is reduce the cost of failure now think about it if a site goes down for five minutes there are going to be some pretty annoyed customers pretty annoyed users but at least we're back up and running pretty quickly now consider that same service that same site goes down for six hours, for 12 hours, for three days, the cost of failure goes up almost exponentially, right? And so you wanna reduce the cost of that failure. And so a large part of what SREs do is to reduce the mean time to repair, okay? Whether that be with their proactive work or their reactive work, but failure is inevitable. And so a really integral part of being an SRE is understanding how to react well to failure, right? And how to use it as a learning process. And that's where the idea of the blameless post-mortem comes in. But when things do go wrong, let's remove blame because blame often lets people, encourages people to shut down and become very defensive and don't always get the answers we need. So remove blame and let's work out what went wrong here. What went wrong so that we document it so that we can ensure that this doesn't happen again. Or if it does happen, we know how to respond even quicker. So that's the concept of the blameless post-mortem. And I actually have a video on this and how you can kind of implement it in your own life because I think it's a really great concept and the idea of removing blame to get to the real root of issues is is key. And the final pillar is shared ownership. Now, one of the objectives of DevOps is to really break down that barrier between development and operations, right? The same is true with site reliability engineering. The idea is that reliability of the service is everyone's responsibility, not just operations, not just development. It is everyone's responsibility because if we can't ensure the reliability of our services there is going to be it's going to be detrimental to the company as a whole and so the idea of shared ownership is key to site reliability engineering right. so hopefully you're starting to see why site reliability engineers are so important and why the work they do is integral um, to the satisfaction of the customer the end user what kind of skills then do they have right what's in their toolbox to ensure that they can do this well Often a site reliability engineer will have knowledge of at least one programming language like Java, like Python. You'll also probably have experience with observability tools. So like New Relic or something like Prometheus. Okay, So these allow you to observe your system. It's about if you can see what's happening, then when something goes wrong, you can identify the issue and move to resolve it as quickly as possible. If you're moving in the dark, it's gonna be very difficult to find your way to the issue that way. A site reliability engineer may also have a lot of experience in testing software and they may integrate that into their process of ensuring reliability of the service. They almost always have some experience with cloud computing and cloud technologies. A lot of the services we use are embedded in the cloud, like thinking about something like Netflix, right? those videos that you click on they're stored somewhere and they're easily accessible because of the cloud so cloud computing is a integral part of an sre's toolbox right? and that could be aws that could be azure that could be gcp so an sre is almost always going to have some experience with infrastructure as code so that's things like terraform like ansible okay? and we spoke about that before how when your infrastructure is you know configured by code as opposed to manual use of consoles manual use of any interface you reduce the chances of um, issues in terms of errors being introduced, but also you have that documented, it's immutable, and everyone can see it, but everyone may not be able to edit it. The only the right people can edit it. You'll also find that SREs have experience with containerization, so that's things like Docker, like Kubernetes. So that leads us on to the final part of this video. If these are all the things that a site reliability engineer can do, what do they do on a day-to-day -day basis? And it can vary quite a lot. So like I said, if you're on call, you might be doing a lot of reactive work, right? When things go wrong, 
if you get an alert that sights down or you know that it's really really slow like the time taken for data retrieval is unacceptable then it's your job there when you're on call to get to the end of that to get to the resolution as quickly as possible but you may be doing more proactive work so you may be trying to optimize you know your cloud technologies right? ensuring that your cloud infrastructure is set up to optimize performance and ensure reliability you may be working to automate parts of the product life cycle so it could be that you're spending quite a lot of time with testing it could be spending a lot of time refining the pipeline or you may be just ensuring that the observability of your service is optimal as well right like are we actually getting alerts for the right things can we see the right parts of the service in terms of the end user experience and so it can vary quite a lot you may also be conducting some blameless post-mortems like we spoke about before when things have gone wrong spending some time really trying to get to the bottom of what went wrong so that it doesn't happen again or less frequently so that's it. I hope it's clear what Site Reliability Engineer does with this kind of high level overview. And you can start to see why they're in such high demand at the moment. I'll leave some resources in the description bar below if you're interested more, if it's something that you're kind of looking to get into. But other than that, I'll see you in the next video.